Welcome back to Bible study on the book of Revelation, sponsored by St. Paul Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I'm Josh. I'm the vicar at the church, and uh, I, I have been going through these studies in person. But now that we're obviously, everybody's doing stay at home, we're not gathering for Bible study, we do still want to be getting into God's Word. So every Tuesday we're releasing, uh, I'm releasing the newest video in the Revelation series. So this next Tuesday we'll be looking at Revelation 15. But we started doing these videos in Revelation 11 and I had people texting me and emailing me saying, me these are great uh, I was at work, I couldn't watch these, but now I can. And I thought, well, it would be kind of nice if they could start at the beginning. So, last Friday we released uh, Revelation chapter 1 and a little bit of an introduction to the book. And this week we're going to be looking at Revelation 2. Now, something I want to start off with, even before we actually get into the study... These are my notes for the study. These are my notes for Revelation 15. This is three pages. This is seven pages. Okay? There is a lot of content in Revelation 2. So, this is going to be a longer video, but uh, that's the beauty of video. You can pause it, you can come back to it, you can do it chunk by chunk. Uh, whatever it takes, you have the freedom to do that. Um, but what Revelation starts with is these letters to the churches. In the first chapter, as you'll recall, we have kind of John being called into this vision, called to share what he learned. Uh, what he saw, what he heard, what he was told. And he goes through that. And there are a lot of references there to make sure we know that this is a revelation from God. This is not just John writing down the ideas that he thinks are good ones. As we move into Revelation 2, what we get to are, are we get to letters written to churches. And there are seven churches at the time. And... Uh, some, some introduction to this is, you know, if we think about why people write letters, um, to address someone personally, to catch up, to, to communicate, to send bills, uh, but there's a little bit of a different tone if it's an open letter, whether that be a, a physical letter or maybe an email or a communicate, if it's, if it's open, um, it's it's a little less personal, but it's it's still it's making connections to a specific people or person, and that's what is being done here. As we talk about these seven letters to the churches, they are close personal communications to the people at each of these congregations, um, and there there's value in letters, there is, and. Uh, what it also communicates is a knowledge of the person you're writing to. You don't write letters to strangers generally. I know there are some exceptions with like pen pal programs or something. Um, but the, the cool thing about God writing letters to his churches is that he's demonstrated in the knowledge of them. Our God isn't an aloof uh, step back. I don't care what's happening to you. I don't care what's going on in your life kind of God. No, he, he knows what is going on in the life of his church, in the lives of his people. And he speaks to that pretty directly. Uh, Christ is concerned and he cares for the church. Um, as we step into this book, there is going to be a uh, structure pretty consistent through all of the letters. It, it starts off with this, it's written to the angel of the church. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that, what that means once we actually get into the text. And then it follows with a descriptive kind of poetic description of Christ. And each of those descriptions is specific to the kind of Christ, the, the, the face of Christ, that would be important for the people to see. And if you, I guess if that's a stumbling block for you, if you think, well, are there different Christs? No, there aren't different Christs, but they're different characteristics that are highlighted 
it's the same when when you're a parent if your kid is hurting if your kid just went through a breakup or uh, got some bad grades or didn't make a team or something like that the parent that they're going to see is probably a very comforting one one that's really highlighting their love for their child and say you know i'm proud of you anyway etc etc but if the kid just did something dumb like set the kitchen on fire because they were making rocket fuel uh, on the stove. True story, not me, friend of mine, beside the point. Um, then the same parent is probably going to respond to them with more of their angry characteristics, uh, more of their disciplinary or punitive characteristics. And it's the same parent, but in the different situations that the child is in, you see different characteristics of the parent. And we're seeing the same thing with, with Christ as he's uh, described and addressed here in Revelation. Moving forward from that, each of the letters, there's a historical recognition for the work that the church has done in its past, the good work the church has done. And then it moves into a danger, uh, a danger for the church, whether that's a flaw or a sin, or a weakness of the members. And what is important to remember is that in each of these instances, the, the danger that's being addressed is a danger to their faith. And this is what makes it really applicable to us, because a lot of the things that were dangerous to faith of the, the early Christians here in Revelation are still dangerous to us are still dangerous to our faith. So these letters are really worth looking at and really chewing down to the bone on what they mean for us and how they apply to our lives. Um, and then, of course, there's a call to repentance. And there's a promise of blessing for those who repent, for those who successfully navigate and avoid this danger, whatever it may be. And then each letter closes with opening it up to all those who read and hear it, which includes us. So I, I mentioned a little bit in the introduction video that Revelation is kind of unique in that we don't have to make a whole lot of leaps to apply it to ourselves. Whereas for a lot of letters, we might have to say, well, this is the context it was written in. Here's kind of the understanding that we have to have to read this. Revelation says, if you are reading this, this applies to you. So that, that puts us pretty directly in application of Revelation. So with that, enough of my build up my introduction. We're going to get into the text and we're going to start with chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and are found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, that is our first letter, our letter to the church at Ephesus. Um, you are obviously on a phone or a computer or something. You can open up a, a, another tab on whatever internet browser you're on. If you want to search uh, a map of the Middle East at the time of... Re or you can actually even just search the seven churches of Revelation and it'll bring up a map and you can kind of see where Ephesus is, especially in relation to Patmos. Um... But we're going we're gonna to walk through this text. And it starts off with, like I said, the angel to the church at Ephesus. Um, one of those symbolized by the seven stars from the first chapter. Uh, some take, there, there's a, there are a few different interpretations 
of these angels of the churches. Some interpret these as literal angels, almost as like guardian angels of the churches. Which isn't an unfair reading. That could totally be the case. But there are alternative interpretations that say these are written to pastors or leaders within the churches. And an angel is kind of a poetic way to talk about them. Um, which I think is also fair. And then some even kind of broaden it up a little further and they say it's just the prevailing spirit of the church. Which is also possible. Um, I think in any of those cases, the application is still the same. This is a letter written for the benefit of those guiding the church and for the edification, for the education of the members of the church. Um, as we go forward, though, the way I'm going to assume them being understood and the way I think is... Uh, I guess the easiest, the most straightforward way to understand them is that they are heavenly beings, that they are angels in, I guess, the more traditional sense of messengers and servants of God. <coughs> because each of the other 67 times in Revelation this word is used, it pretty clearly refers to angels. So I'm going to go with it. It probably means just angels. Although I don't think any of those alternative interpretations are unfair or detract from the meaning of the letters. We're going to go forward. Um, some details on Ephesus, the church that this is be being written to. Uh, the imperial cult was big here. Um, especially Dominican. This is the worship of the Roman emperors as deities. Uh, and Ephesus was big on this, especially, as I said, the, um, the emperor Dominican, uh, Dominican, I'm, I'm not a Latin guy, so if I'm pronouncing that wrong, my apologies. It was written during a time of persecution of the church by the empire. So the fact that the imperial cult was big in Ephesus would have put a lot of pressure on the Christians there because they would have been facing legalized uh, government sanctioned persecution. Um, this is the church that Paul and Priscilla and Aquila helped build. Uh, Ephesus is a major hub in Asia. And in the midst of all of this, the Ephesian church is known for sanctity and steadfastness, which makes a lot of sense. If a church is going to survive for any length of time in an environment that is so hostile to its existence, there has to be a level of steadfastness, obviously. And the believers you have are, are good. There's going to be a, a sanctity because they're, they're, you're not going to get people who are doing, who are faithful for alternative reasons. People who are doing it to improve their social standing or be in, in a certain kind of club or whatever because this club is getting persecuted. So those who are in the church at Ephesus are probably very genuine in their faith and would, as a result, do their best to live it out. They weren't just doing it because it was the expectation. They weren't just doing it because it was popular. They, there were no other reasons. So what this resulted in is them living it out, I think, more faithfully. Especially if you compare it sometimes to the American church, I think you can see this. Because like, if you look at politicians, it, it is harder to get elected if you are not at least nominally a member of a church. Um, you've, you've even seen some politicians switch denominations because another denomination has a higher chance of getting them elected if they can say, I am part of this denomination. Um, especially if, if, maybe not so much now, but if you go a little bit back into American history, it was expected that you go to church. So if you, you didn't necessarily have to be a faithful Christian to go to church. It was the societal expectation. So unless you had a serious problem with the church, you went 
Um, so I think that's something we can probably look up to in the Ephesian church as we, they are there. We should be at church because we genuinely have faith and we want to build our relationship with Christ. Um, not for any of these other, other more base reasons. Um, anyway, uh, moving forward, that's talking about the church at Ephesus. We're going to move forward to this, the words of him who holds the seven stars and, uh, walks among the seven golden lampstands. Um, like I said, this is the descriptive, uh, I guess, addressing of Christ. This is the poetic description of Christ. And, um, what this is, it's highlighting Christ's presence with his church. It's the, if you go back to chapter one, the seven golden lampstands are the church in the world. So if we're talking about a, a Christ who walks among them, that's a Christ who is in the midst of his people, who is present with the church, who is holding those angels of the churches in his hand because he, he takes stock and he genuinely cares about his people, which makes sense. That, that is the Christ that the people of Ephesus need to see because they're struggling. They're being persecuted. They, it is comforting to know if you are in that time of persecution that God cares about you and is walking with you. So at this time, I think this is a really good reminder to us too. Because we're struggling. We, we can't meet. We can't be in community. I, I'm doing this Bible study in a video instead of being with you guys in person. This, this is a time of struggle. So it's really good for us to stop and remember that Christ walks with us and walks among us. Um, now something I did in my in-person classes, as I was doing this little bit about Christ walking among the churches, I walked among the tables. And then the follow-up question that I asked was, how does it feel? How does it feel when I'm walking among the, the tables? And I got uh, some different reactions. Some people said, oh, it's comforting, you're, you're like in our midst, you're, it's attention grabbing, and they were very positive. <laughs> and, and then I had some more, um, I don't want to say honest, but I'm going to say honest people who said it was a little anxiety inducing. Uh, they were a little worried that I was like going to call on them or, or call them out or something like that. Um, which to be fair is something I might do. Uh, um. <laughs> But, sorry, I have a guitar next to me, and every time I talk, it's buzzing, and it's driving me nuts. <clears throat> but what I, I want to draw from that is that when Christ is walking among the churches, I think this can have two effects. This does have the effect of it's comforting. He's, he's with us. He, he cares about us. But I also think it has this effect of why is he here? Why is he so close? Is is he calling us out for something? And there could be a little bit of anxiety there. Which is fair. Because that's what happens here. Um, he moves forward and he compliments the church, first off. For their patient endurance in the face of constant toil. And this is what Ephesus was known for. For standing up to idols. For constantly watching for Christ. <clears throat> But they also had to constantly watch for danger in the midst of this imperial persecution that they faced. And what I think is really important to draw out is it says here, um, you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. This is for the name of Christ, not for us. Not for themselves not to achieve some statement or something. They were doing it for Christ's name. Which I, I think is important for us as um, we might feel the need to stand up. To stand up for our faith. To stand up for our ethics. Um, to stand up for all sorts of things. And I think it's important to keep in mind in the midst of those things that we're doing it for the sake of Christ. And for the sake of his name. And that's the motivation we need to keep before us as we go forward. Because the second 
The second it becomes about something else, we shouldn't be doing it. It's not worth doing. It shouldn't be done. Um, so, uh, with that, continuing through the text, it, another compliment, he says, uh, you don't bear with the Nicolaitans. Or, you don't bear with those... who are evil, who call themselves apostles and are not. Um, so I, I have a little bit of a tangent here. And that is, uh, it talks about testing those who call themselves apostles and rejecting the false ones, which is good. That's, that's something that we should uplift. But the question is, how do we test who are false apostles? And the answer very quickly uh, is the Bible. We compare what they're teaching to the word of God. Which is true, but there's a balance to be found here with something called fundamentalism, which a lot of people are in, in our circles, as if you're watching this, you're a member of St. Paul, you're in the Lutheran circle, um, are comfortable with. And a lot of denominations of more conservative Christianity are on board with fundamentalism. They think it's great. Uh, so there are there are five pillars of fundamentalism, and those are. This is all circa 1910. There's biblical inspiration and scriptural infallibility, which we agree with. The virgin birth of Jesus, which we agree with. Belief that Christ's death was atonement for sin, yes. Bodily resurrection of Christ, yes. Historical reality of the miracles of Jesus. Yes, we agree with all of these things. We uphold the truth and the veracity of the Bible. Um, what this came as in 1910, so 110 years ago, this was a reaction to modernist theology that wanted to reduce the Bible to a series of, of fables and allegories and, and metaphors. Um, it was against liberalism and something called historical criticism, which said if we find things in the historical rec record that conflict with the Bible, we got to throw the Bible, the part that part of the Bible out, because obviously our new historical finding is more accurate. So fundamental fundamentalism was a reaction to that, and uh, that was 1910. This is 2020, and now there are problems with fundamentalism. And, and here's the problems that we find with fundamentalism are there is a reality of pub, <coughs> of a public image that fundamentalism now has. I googled fundamentalism and I went to the images tab and I kid you not, the first thing that came up was a, a cartoon graphic that has five pillars and a title on each of the pillars. Uh, of what they are. And these are the five pillars of fundamentalist Christianity. Hysteria, denial of reality, thought control, name calling, and projection of guilt. This is a problem. And you might say, that's not what fundamentalism is about. We ought to fight for the image of fundamentalism. No. No, I say it again. No. Okay. If the problem, if, if this is the public image of fundamentalism we're not called to to defend a philosophy from 110 years ago like we just talked about we're doing everything for christ's namesake we don't need the title of fundamentalism to defend the name of christ so we're okay to drop it and, and you might say well why are we just going to cave to those people who are calling fundamentalism bad things but there, there's a problem, and I'm, I'm putting this cycle up because we have this destructive cycle of fundamentalism. So we're going to start with fundamentalism, which has this problematic public image. And I think we can all agree on that, that the, the public image of fundamentalism is not a good one and it is problematic. And you go forward, and the response is to defend scripture. This is generally done by arguing. 
and by fighting with people and and trying to prove them wrong or if that doesn't work to to discredit them somehow uh which first of all isn't demonstrating the love of christ at all and uh i've never met anyone who became a christian because they were uh because they lost an argument so what are we accomplishing here and the, the worst part is that, as you see on this cycle, is it moves into a justification by science. Because we, we feel like uh, in our arguments we need to be able to prove our faith. So we take these bits of scientific evidence and, and use them to justify the Bible, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. There is a place for that. To, and it's kind of cool to see where science and the discoveries we make fit in with the Bible. But some, some problems with this are, first of all, a lot of the people who make these arguments are, uh, <laughs> are not scientists. They don't actually know how to read a research study. They don't know how to interpret. Um, and they lose. They, they generally lose because it's, it's totally out of their, out of their expertise. And the, the worst part is it takes the eternal out of argument. If we try to reduce everything to science, we're taking the miracles out of it. We're, we're taking the eternal out of it because all of that stuff is beyond the scope of science. And, and then we go forward. Uh, or I guess a couple more points on that. Some examples of this justification by science are the Creation Museum. Is it kind of cool? Yeah. Is it somehow proof? Is it a, a argument ender? Not really. Uh, alternatively, there are straw man arguments, which for those of you who, uh, I, I hope I'm using this correctly, people will set up scientific arguments and then topple them, but they selectively choose the scientific arguments that they're setting up to topple. It's like picking a, a really easy opponent for a fight and then saying you're a great fighter because you beat up this really easy opponent. Like, no. And, and if you ever get into a debate with someone who actually knows what they're talking about, you're going to be in deep trouble. Um, but the, the big, the crux of all this problem that all of this leads into is a faith in science, which was what the problem was in the first place. But the, the reality is that you're... You're starting to look at science to prove your faith. Instead of looking at science as a cool thing and faith as faith. Our faith should be in Christ, not whether or not we can prove what we believe. Our faith is in Christ and Him crucified. It's not even in the Bible. Our faith isn't in the Bible first. It's in Christ and His death and resurrection first. We believe in the Bible because... He told us it was worth believing in. He told us, he, he verified its, its accuracy and its validity and its inspiration. We believe in the Bible because he said so. We don't believe in Jesus because the Bible said so. Which I think is a difficult thing. But there's the reality. So what I hope I've established in kind of this rant, this tangent, this soapbox, is that fundamentalism isn't worth pushing people away from Christ. Let it go. Do everything for Christ's name's sake. Do everything for the love of Christ, and in Christ's love. So, which is where he goes from here. With Ephesians is he then goes forward and uh, he talks about enduring patiently and bearing up for his name's sake and then he gets to the danger of the church this I have against you that you've abandoned the love you had at first remember therefore where for or therefore from where you have fallen uh, this first love it's, it could be a brotherly love. It could be the first love for Christ. And I want to discuss both levels. Um, because the word that's used here is agape love. It's, it's covenantal. It's abiding. It's, it's 
a transcendent kind of love. Um, and that's what we have before us. So my question for you, and this is our first discussion question below, is what do you think the danger is for a church that forgets each kind of love? What do you think the danger is for a church that forgets their brotherly love? What do you think the danger is for a church that uh, forgets their love of Christ? Which might be a more obvious answer. But that's the question I want to put before you. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you have to say about it. Getting back to our discussion and our text. Remember from where you've fallen, repent. Um, this is a quintessential example of repentance. You've fallen, you messed up. Remember how to not do that and go forward in that way. Um, so with that, I have some reflection questions for you. And these are for you. The, these are not going to be comments below. These are just for you, for your reflection. What are some ways you have personally fallen away from this love for God or love shown to others? What are some ways that you have fallen short lately? And my follow-up question to that is, how can you get back to doing those works? And again, this is a reflection question because it's not something for us to all weigh in on. This is for you and your conscience. And to, to pray about, to speak with God about. Um, but that's a reflection I have for you. I would encourage you to pause this video for a few seconds and just think about that. We're going to move forward uh, because the, the consequence here is, if not, if you don't have this repentance, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place. This is Christ who is talking. This is a very serious threat. And I just have a question for you. What if Christ were to come down and say, I am going to remove St. Paul Lutheran Church and school from Boca Raton? <coughs> or if you're watching from another church, what if Christ himself were to come down and say, I'm going to take your church out of this community, out of this place? And we think, that's really harsh. What good is that going to do? And my response to that is, when a church doesn't have either of these kinds of love, why bother? I mean, if you don't have the love for Christ, obviously, why bother? Like, that's what the church is about. It is all for Christ's name's sake. But if you don't have love for neighbor, what are, what are you accomplishing? First of all, you're not being very faithful to Christ and his teachings. But if you don't have that love for Christ, or if you don't have that love for brother, the church's mission in the world is failing. We're failing. So what good are we doing in the community that we're put into anyway? Um, the, the letter then goes forward. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans. This comes up a couple times. Uh, the teachings of the Nicolaitans were the teachings of cheap grace, which is this idea that I'm forgiven anyway, so what I do doesn't matter. Because I know at the end of the day, Christ is going to forgive me, so I don't have to strive to live like he wants me to live. We're called to better than that. Um, but that's, he he's talking about how the Ephesians, they hate those works. Um... And then the text closes this letter and says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, you have an ear. This applies to you. If you're struggling with this, this applies to you. If you're not showing love to your brother or to your neighbor, if you don't have a love for Christ, this is a call for you to repent. To, to return to that love for neighbor and for Christ. If you are standing steadfast in the midst of persecution, whatever that looks like, this is encouragement for you that Christ walks with you and supports you. And uh, if you are struggling with doing things and your motivation is not for Christ's name's sake, this is, this is for you. This is a reminder for you 
to do things for Christ in his name. Um, and then this letter closes with the line, um, to him who conquers, uh, I will give, I will grant to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Uh, this is, this is the tree that is forbidden to man in Genesis three, verse 22 through 24. The Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man in the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Um, so this is the tree of life that he's, he's talking about. To he who conquers, to he who perseveres in the faith. Or she, um, we're admitted back into paradise, which is something really cool to look forward to. So with that, we're going to move forward in Revelation 2 to Revelation 2 verse 8, which reads, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So, uh, similarities with the other letter, you still have the angel of the church. And it starts off to the angel of the church, and then you have this poetic description of Christ. Um, and it talks about him as the first and the last who died and came to life. What this accomplishes is it gives the the church the readers the audience us perspective it, it puts everything back in perspective of this eternal christ um so going forward a few of the details about smyrna who is the city that this letter is being written to um this was a city with a well-known stadium uh, a library a public theater it was a very cultural city um and it was another city that extolled the imperial cult. So with that, there would have been persecution. There would have been all the things that go along with that. Um, going forward into the knowledge of the church, I know your tribulation uh, and poverty. <coughs> this is pretty literal. Uh, early Christians were suffering and by and large, they were poor. Uh, being Christian made it very hard to find employment, to have a job, to to not be poverty stricken. Um, and their poverty here in Smyrna would have been highlighted by the city's wealth. Um, but he has this note in here, even though you are rich, this is spiritual richness. This is spiritual richness and... Uh, my question for you as we go forward is this. Um, what are our tribulations in the American church today? And I really want you, before you, this is a discussion question below. I would like you to fill it out. But before you fill it out, I would like you to stop and think for a second about Genuine tribulations versus imagined or perceived tribulations. Um, because I think we're really quick to jump on the perception of tribulation, but I think there's a, there's a difference between that and then the reality of suffering of tribulation. So think about that for a second and then respond below and then come back to us. And as we come back, uh, we go forward in the text. And it says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. The devil's about to throw you in prison. Um, this noticeably lacks one element of the traditional structure. 
and that is there it doesn't really speak of a danger and an internal danger to the church what it's speaking about here instead is an external danger which speaks to christians who are not struggling against themselves and maybe you are one of them as you're watching this bible study as we go through the letters maybe you're like i'm not really struggling with this or with that at this point maybe you are you are strong in your faith you're consistently attending online worship you are doing these bible studies you're watching the devotions you're you're reading your bible but there is this speaks to to those christians too um it speaks to those who are maybe only suffering externally um and this is a tendency of humanity i think there's a tendency to, uh, when we think we're doing well, we forget God. You forget God in the good times. Uh, and what this is saying is prepare for the tough times. When there is going to be suffering and persecution. Um, and what this speaks to is maybe fear as a danger to the faith. Which I think is especially true because we, we are part of a faith that says don't defend yourself. It says, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Don't get revenge. Don't, don't defend yourself in that way. Which I think is something really hard for us to hear. As American Christians especially, because of the American way is you stick up for yourself. You defend yourself. If someone hits you, you hit them back harder. Um, they send one of yours to the hospital, you send one of theirs to the morgue. Um... But that's not what our faith calls us to. So these these Christians in Smyrna, they were fearing literal violence against them in the midst of a faith that taught them not to defend themselves. So this, this was going to be a struggle for them. And the, if this fear was taken too far, they might distance themselves from the faith uh, to, to protect themselves. Um, so my table discussion for you, or table discussion, the discussion I want you guys to have below is, um, what are some things that Christians fear today? What are some things that we are afraid of, whether that be uh, for our faith, for ourselves, for our families? And... As we look at that, and as you go below and look at the comments that people have put, um, unless you're the first one to comment, in which case, get it started, um, is these fears can draw us away from the faith. If we're afraid it's going to get, it's going to be harder to be employed if we say we can't work on Sundays. Maybe we don't say we can't work on Sundays. We draw a little bit back. If we're afraid our kid isn't going to succeed, if we say they can't do sports practice, if it means they're going to be missing church, or they can't go, uh, they can't be on a team that consistently plays on Sundays, we're afraid that they're not going to go as far. If that is the case, and we maybe draw away from the faith a little bit, um. And it's in this instance where it's really important for us to support one another. To, to reassure, your kid is going to be fine. You are going to be fine, even if you have to put up these barriers to protect your faith. Even if being faithful means that you're going to lose out in other aspects of life. Um, because our call here is to be faithful unto death. Which I think is really cool because it puts, us, puts this all in perspective. Um, which brings me something that I would ask myself a lot as a college student when I got nervous about things. Um, and it's become really ingrained for me. So like you can, you can speak to my wife, you can speak to, uh, pastor Andrew actually about how difficult it is for me to be stressed out. Like the amount of stuff it takes for me to actually genuinely feel stress is absurd. It takes truly catastrophic events for me to feel any stress. 
And that's because uh, several years ago, I just, whenever I started feeling stressed, I asked myself a question. What is the worst that could happen? And the cynical person, the cynical side of me would always answer, well, I could die. If I was afraid of a test, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, the worst isn't that I could fail the test. The worst could be that while I'm in the building taking the test, the ceiling collapses and I die under a mound of rubble. And having that, you know, four years at undergrad and me constantly telling myself that, like, eh, what's the worst that could happen? Um, in combination with my faith, what's the worst that could happen? I could die. And then I get to go be with Jesus. So if we keep all of this in perspective, what's the worst that could happen? We could die and be with Jesus. Works for me. Um, and it talks about giving uh, the crown of life. Now, an important detail that I'm going to come back to several times in Revelation is that the crown is a symbol of victory, not of royalty. Um, victory over sin death and the devil that is what the crown of life is symbolic of um and this apply this all applies to us as those fears that are talked about below as you go through them in in each of those instances what is the worst that could happen we have the crown of life if we remain faithful there's there's not much that can happen that is going to do anything to tarnish that in fact there's nothing that could happen that can tarnish that um, going forward, it says, uh, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Uh, this is a connection to the crown of victory. So the second death refers to the eternal death, to separation from God, eternal separation from God. And that is what we are safe from. Um, as we go forward in this, with that, we are going to continue to the next letter that is Revelation 12 or Revelation 2 12 to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with a sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Um, so as always, <coughs> we start off with the angel to the church. And then we go from that to the description of Christ so that the church needs to hear. And it says... Uh, the one who has the two-edged sword of the gospel. This is frequently a symbol for the word of God, which um, is both comforting when we need that comfort, but is also something, uh, the, the law is the word of God. And there can be some conviction, there can be some uh, drive for that. Um, so some details on the city of Pergamum. Uh, this is a city that had a library of 200,000 volumes. So at the time, it was a huge library, famous for their pagan altars and temples. They had a great altar of Zeus. The, the patron of the city was Athena. Um, they had a temple of Asclepios for healing, which attracted people. And eventually, it did also become a center for that emperor worship that we've been talking about previously. Um, so this is a city that is, is well learned for the time and, and has this wealth of, of religion and religiosity. So in a lot of ways, we can probably draw a lot of parallels from Pergamum to America. Um, 
a place of learning and a place of a lot of idolatry of a whole host of different things. Um, as we go forward into the knowledge of the church, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. This is probably a reference to all of the centers of pagan worship. Um, and this is a reminder that Satan is behind the persecution for the church. Satan is behind all of these false religions. And I think there's a lesson here for us is the lesson not to blame the tool. We're called to love those, who, uh, pray for those and love those who persecute us. And I think it's really helpful if, if we look at those who persecute us in whatever way that looks like as tools that Satan is using against the church. We, we don't blame the tools. If anything, we feel pity for them that they're being used in this way. And we reach out to them in love and we pray for them that they are freed from that. Um, which I think is a good lesson for us today. Uh, Antipas is a martyr. He was a leader in the community as we go forward. Um, that they didn't deny the faith even when he was killed. Um, and then he moves from that into these pitfalls for the church. Uh, the teachings of Balaam who, who taught Balak. Uh, this is uh, an Old Testament story from Numbers 31. The sin of Balaam was the sin of serving two masters. Saying you can serve God and these idols. Uh, Balaam comes in Numbers 31 and he's teaching the Israelites these things. Uh, so again, this is a call to test the, the teachings of leadership. Now, some things that I want to throw out here as, uh, I guess, a leader in the church and on behalf of, of leaders in the church, test new things. Uh, don't just test things for no reason. Like if, if myself or Steve or Andrew or whoever your pastor is, is preaching or doing a devotion and we're teaching a lesson that has been taught for thousands of years, like if we're teaching that baptism is important, you don't necessarily have to question that um, seriously. I mean, if you have questions about it, by all means, ask. If you want to say, well, where do, where do these teachings come from? Ask and we can point you to those devotions. But you don't have to question things just for the sake of questioning things. If, there, if it's not a sincere question um, or a sincere doubt, uh, that's not what it's calling for. Um, you don't have to challenge everything. Just challenge the things that are worth challenging. Uh, so that's the, the sin of Balaam. And I think, again, this is a struggle in our society because our society says you can do both. We have this buffet table of religions where, oh, you can take this from this faith and this from this faith. So we say, oh, you can be Christian and you can be forgiven. But people will say, well, you can still make an idol of sports, of grades, of... Uh, money of job of employment you can still do all those things and still be christian no if you are a christian these things cannot become an idol for you our god is the triune god the god of abraham isaac and jacob the god who came to earth as jesus christ who works in our lives as the holy spirit our god is nothing else we cannot make idols of those other things so i think this is this is a danger for us and this is a reading we can take pretty seriously um Going forward, there are, uh, talks about the sin of Balaam, and then he says, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Again, this is that cheap grace um, that encourages the idolatry. That says, you're forgiven anyway, so go ahead and skip church for that soccer match, for that, uh, for that game, football game, for that uh, job opportunity, for that meeting, for sleep. Um, don't do that Bible study. It, just watch TV. Um, you're forgiven anyway. That's this cheap grace idea, and we're called to better. Uh, we are called to better. And there's the threat that follows here. Um, but before we go into that, I, I want to take a second. And this is a question that, again, this is for you. This is not a discussion question for below. What are some of the other masters that you serve? What are some things you struggle with idolizing? I want you to pause the video and I want you to take about 15 seconds and I want you to really think about that. 
and pray about God turning your heart away from them. Um, and we're going to move forward into, if not, if you don't repent, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. This is the word of God that both condemns and lifts up this two-edged sword that was talked about earlier. Um, the word of God is uplifting for those who are crushed by their sins, who are suffering. But for those who, who aren't, it can be convicting. Um, so that's, that's what he's talking. He's speaking God's word against the people. Um, and then it goes forward to these blessings, uh, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone. Uh, the white stone is actually, this is a sentence of innocence. If you go into, uh, the courts of law of the time, if someone was acquitted of a crime, the, the judge would frequently actually like literally hand them a white stone. And that was a declaration of their acquittal. Um, so there, there's this statement of innocence. And then you have the bread of life, the hidden manna, uh, the Lord's Supper. Um, which speaks a little bit to our interpretation of communion. That it is the real presence of God. And it is hidden because we don't know how it works. We just know that God says he is present in that meal. And we leave it at that. Because going any further is us making stuff up that's not actually in scripture. Um, so that's a connection that we have to the hidden manna. Um, and then my, my question for you, and I believe this is down below as well. What do you think these blessings mean? Uh, beyond and above what I already explained. Um, so with that, we are going to go into this last section of chapter 2. Uh, verses 18 to through 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate this woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. All the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who don't hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, do not lay on you, I, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will re rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my father, and I will let give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, um, as we start off, structural things we have to the angel of the church, description of the Christ that the, the church needs. Eyes like flames of fire, feet like burnished bronze. Uh, the flaming eyes are symbolic of righteous anger. And the bronze feet are, are standing firm and determined in the face of enemies of the church. Um, and he's referred pretty explicitly here as the Son of God. As a reminder that Christ is divine. This is the only time he's referred to this way, this specifically, in the book of Revelation. Um, going forward, we have the city of Thyatira. Um, what is it known for? It's known for the dying of purple cloth. Um, which, among other things, made it a commercial center. This was not a heavily religious context. If we go back, the first churches we looked at, they were all centers of the imperial cult. They had pagan idols, etc., etc. Thyatira was more of just a business place, a business area. Um, so as we go forward, uh, it speaks to 
knowledge of the church. Uh, it speaks to their works. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance. So this is a church that is very active in the faith. They want to do good. They want to be good in their community. Um, but there are pitfalls from the church. And there is this character, Jezebel, who is probably not a literal person. She's used as a symbol. If you go back into both books of Kings, Jezebel is a queen who draws the people of God, who draws Israel away from God. And she did a lot of evil things. And she was known for something called syncretism. Which is this idea that many paths lead to heaven. Now, this is uncomfortable for us. Because this is definitely an American idea. This is a, a Christian, uh, something that happens a lot in Christian churches in America. This idea that it doesn't matter what you believe, eventually everyone is going to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Christ teaches. That, that's not what we teach. It, it's uncomfortable, though, because we all have friends and family members who are outside the church. And if we say everyone doesn't go to heaven, you do have to believe in Christ to go to heaven. That means we're saying some people are going to hell, and that's something uncomfortable to say. Especially because I think it encourages us to action, and we don't really like being called to that. It's uncomfortable that we have this, this call to mission. Um, and if you want to hear more about that, the, there's a podcast that just got released on St. Paul's YouTube page. It's called Real Mission, Real Gospel. I would encourage you to look for that. Um, now, that being said, we go forward and he talks about Jezebel, but it says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses. So my question for you is, what are some ways that God's put, God puts people in a position to repent today? And then how can we support people in the midst of that? Um, those are discussion questions below. Pause this video and comment on them. Um, as we return, I will give to you according to... Um, I will give to each of you according to your works. We have a just God. And this sounds like a concern. Like, what do you mean? We have, do we have to do enough good things to earn? No, our works are covered in Jesus. And that is the beauty of it. You see, nothing we do outside of Christ is good. Even if it's good, it is not good. It is not just, it is not right because we are sinners performing it. But everything we do in Christ is made righteous. Um, and then we get into these blessings of the church. Uh, to the rest of you in Thyatira who don't hold to the deep things of Satan, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them, etc., uh, etc. Et so, first, these deep things of Satan. What does that mean? These are probably, this is another reference to the teachings of Jezebel. These ideas of universalism and syncretism where you don't really have to be a Christian. You don't really have to be in the church. That's a dangerous teaching. Um, but as we go forward in this, what is the blessing? To him I will give authority over the nations. This is a reminder that we are called into faith, we are invited into faith as co-heirs of the kingdom with Christ, not as slaves. So we are given this authority with Christ in, in, in heaven, and that is incredible. Um, and I will give him the morning star. The brightest star in God's heavenly host. This is Jesus' honor. We, we get to share in his glory. That's the promise that is given to us. Um, and that's where we close. As if we are faithful, we are given this authority. We are given this promise. Um, we made it through seven pages of material on this second chapter of Revelation. Um, if you have any questions, please post them below. I, I check periodically. And if there are any questions... Uh, I will answer them um, to the best of my ability. So with that, uh, that's been Revelation 2. Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, we will continue through this video series. I, I hope it remains helpful to you. Please comment, get involved in the discussion below. I love to see that. And uh, brothers, go in peace.
Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.